video. All right. So we're here. Uh, today is the August 15th, 2021. And we start in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verses from 1 to 10. And the title of the uh, lesson is Metkisede, the priest. So let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for giving us another day of life. Thank you for giving us another opportunity to study and scrutinize your word. Give us your wisdom, dear Lord, so we can uh, understand what we study and give us your strength so we can put into practice what we do learn. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, I'm going to start reading from 1 to 10. This is going to be kind of tricky. Yeah. So the pizza is here. Okay. Question. Oh, my goodness, uh, he, must be, he must be hungry. I will do pizza. It's not. All right. So verse 1. <clears throat> this Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of, the, of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also, king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the son of God, he remains a priest forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the Lord requires that the descendants of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from the fellow Israelites, even though they also are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. And in one case, the tenth is collected by people who die, but in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, Pay the tenth to Abraham because when Melchizedek met, met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of, the, of his ancestor. Okay. That's kind of difficult, huh? yes. I mean, what, what are we talking about here? I was reading it uh, when I was in the car and I said, oh, I gotta find out what this is. What means. are we talking about here? <laughs> it seems to be uh, so uh, confusing. What is this? Yeah. Okay. First of all, you don't find many mentions about Mel Melchizedek in the Bible. No. So, I know, only on the Psalm and the Genesis. Yeah. That's like twice. That's it. And now in the Hebrews. I didn't, I didn't read it in Genesis. Is well, that, it is come from Genesis uh, 14, 18, 20. 14, 18, 20. Okay. That's, just, that's when Melchizedek comes. You know, remember when Abraham was <coughs> living in uh, this place and then uh, war came that his son Lot and other and all his family had been kidnapped by this king. Yeah. So Abraham got together three hundred of his servants and went to fight these two kings and defeat them. Yeah. Okay. So after the defeat of these kings, he went and uh, then he met Melchizedek. This guy comes out of nowhere. Yeah, right. And then he comes and uh, he not only is blessed by Melchizedek, but he gives him the tenth of everything. Right. And then he evaporates, goes, goes away. Yeah. You never heard from him. And uh, one of the Psalms mentioned it. So he comes and goes. Who is this guy? You know? Not, not only that, but he says, he's going to be a priest forever. Yeah. Like Jesus Christ. Like not Jesus Christ. If some people say he might be, no, like Jesus Christ. So we're going to scrutinize that. So all right? he's still alive today. Yeah. Uh, so, Ooh, Melchizedek. Melchizedek. But uh, now, no, he's making a comparison between Melchizedek and Jesus. And Jesus. Jesus is alive, of course. So he's saying Melchizedek yeah. came like Jesus Christ is coming like a priest, right. like Jesus Christ. And Jesus is a is a high priest, he our forever. only high priest. Yeah. This is the guy who lives forever. Okay, Melchizedek was just a, uh, I believe it's just a passing person to make a comparison with. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna try to. I understand this, and uh, it's up to me to. I was like, <laughs> I know. Okay, so let me let's read the first uh, verse. Uh, Nico. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. Okay, in the old Genesis stories, 
chapter 14, 1820, Melchizedek is a strange and almost eerie figure. He arrives out of the blue. There is nothing about his life, his birth, his death, or his descent. He simply arrives. He gives Abraham bread and wine, which to us, reading the passage in the light of what we know, sounds so sacramental, you know, like the Lord's Supper. He places Abraham. And then he vanishes from the stage of history with the same unexplained suddenness as he arrived. As we will wonder that in the mystery of this story, the writer of the Hebrews found a symbol of Christ. He comes close to allegorizing or fictionalizing, although he does not actually say so or do so. And then the second paragraph, he said, this Melchizedek was king of Salem. Salem is like a Jerusalem. And priest of the Most High. How could it be priest of God Most High? I mean, that's a big title. Right. You can't get, I mean, there's no priest higher than that, right. right? This first verse is a statement of facts in line with the account of Genesis 14, 17, 20. It speaks of Melchizedek's position as both king of Salem and priest of the most high God. This combination between kingship and priesthood turns out to be significant for the writer's purpose <clears throat> as the next verses show. It is immaterial for him where Salem was located. It's a strong tradition that should be identified with Jerusalem. Now, the tithe here given to God is worth really noting, nothing, for it is, it is found that not only in Genesis, but also in Deuteronomy and various places in the Old Testament. It draws attention to the exalted character of God. Any priesthood is evaluated according to the status of the deity who is ser served, which means that Melchizedek must have been of the highly exalted kind. So what does he say here? A priesthood, is value depends who does the, whose God does the priesthood serve, right. right? Now we serve what we believe is the God of the universe, right? All right? Nobody, nobody can tap that. Here, Melchizedek is serving the most high God, which is the same God that we serve. Right. So it's nobody above Melchizedek. Right. That's what it describes in Genesis. Doesn't give you an explanation, just describes it. Right. He is like that. Comes out of nowhere, and he is like that. So the writer of the Hebrews wants his readers to accept this as a statement of fact. Right. Okay, that's what he's saying. You gotta accept that because it's in Genesis and that's what he says. Okay, it's a matter of faith, all right? Uh, how, where he come from, doesn't say. It just states, he is like that. The same with Jesus Christ, you know? He came to this world and he is what he is. And we, we, uh, we worship him because what he is, not his descendants, not his mother, not his father, but he is the son of the most high God. The so high he God. makes a, comp the whole lesson makes a comparison. Melchizedek is like Jesus Christ, okay, in the order of priesthood. So this, uh, Abraham has a brother, Aaron. Aaron was a high priest, the first high priest. Then the descendants of Abraham, are the, all the priests were Levites, tri tribal Levites you know, priesthood, okay? And then the Levites are descendants of Aaron or descendants of Abraham, all right? So they're all the descendants of uh, uh, Abraham are Levites, like we are. We are also descendants. We are uh, a nation of priesthood or priests, we are. Okay, so we're gonna keep on doing. Now, it, it draws attention to the category, okay. Okay, then he says he met Abraham returning for the defeat of the kings and bless him. Remember we story? that Abraham rescued his son, his nephew Lot, and uh, his family, and he fought these two kings that defeated them, you know? And then after he returns, he meets this guy, right. who comes out of nowhere, yeah. right? Um, and then the, the meeting of Melchizedek with Abraham is a feature which brings Melchizedek into the biblical story. He comes to the conclusion of Abraham's part in the conflict between two confederacies of kings. Abraham's remarkable victory, however, is not what's really important to the author, but he's been blessed by Melchizedek, okay? It's not that uh, Abraham, with only 300 men, defeated these people. That's not important. The important is that Melchizedek blessed him. But who is Melchizedek? That's the thing, you know? Which at once placed uh, Melchizedek in a position of superiority. Of, now, the lesser, you know, the, the, somebody blesses you, that somebody is greater than you. You cannot bless somebody higher than you, right? right. Okay, so that's what he says here. So Melchizedek blessed Abraham, and Abraham was all the way up there. He's a patriarch, right. he's a leader, he's a, a, 
I mean, he's in the, in, the, in the level to the Christians and to the Jews. You, nobody, when you say we are sons of Abraham, I mean, nobody can tap that. So as man goes, Abraham was all the way up. But then Melchizedek is even higher. So the writer of Hebrews says, this is what Genesis says. Yeah. It just says there, you know, it's like a, when, when Genesis says God created the world, you know, you gotta accept that. If you don't accept it, then you got a problem. You, the faith is not there, right? No. But once you affect the first verse of Genesis, the rest of the Bible, you have no problem believing it, right? right? Because if God created the universe, he can solve your personal problem anytime. Of course. Right? But we fail, you know, we gotta go back to basics. You know, when, yeah. when Pastor George tells us in, on, the, on the weekends, he says that uh, the things I'm telling you here is things you already know. I'm just reminding you we already know. Right. And it's true, we, f we do forget things. And it's good that people remind us to recharge our batteries, kind of, uh, okay? You do because you get embroiled in everyday life. You sure. Know? So you do tend to, you know, like, like I've been very, very frustrated because I really can read and concentrate and I got so much worry that it's really piling up on me and, you know, so I think, come on, I need time, you know. Yeah. To get yeah. to my reading, to, to... You need time to discuss these things yeah. in a relaxed manner. Right, right. Because not uh, worrying about the time. Oh, no, well, no. You know, I this this is not a test. Yeah. This is not an exam that you gotta, yeah. you gotta go through it. No, it's a I relaxed manner. Relax. I like to sit there and relax sure. and, and read. And I can even do that. Yeah, so we, I have a, a, a Bible class on Saturdays. It's in Spanish. And we do have a class which lasts about 45 minutes. And then after that, we... Uh, we talk, talk like, like for two hours, and we talk about yeah, like things. Like we used to do before, now we don't even Now do with that. the pandemic, yeah. people are scared. Well, anyway, let's, so let's continue. So he said he made Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings he blessed. The meeting of Melchizedek with Abraham is a feature which brings, you know, uh, Melchizedek into the Luke story. It comes at the conclusion of Abraham's part in a conflict between these two kings. Abraham's remarkable victory, however, is not what's really important to the author, but he's being blessed by Melchizedek which at once placed Melchizedek in a position of superiority to Abraham. This in itself will be regarded as a high dignity by Christian Jews as well as Orthodox non-Christian Jews, with Abraham in the highest esteem, which is great. Abraham was high, you know, in the non-Christian Jews and Christian Jews. So verse two, Romeo. Okay, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. But Abraham giving Melchizedek a tithe, taken from the Genesis narrative, reinforces the superiority of the latter. By doing this, Abraham acknowledged the right of Melchizedek to receive it. Now, uh, Aaron was a priest, a high priest. A high priest was commanded to, to get tithes from the Israelites. Now, the tithes, was not a voluntary thing. It was mandatory. It's a, it's a form of taxation, <laughs> yeah, okay? Now, in our case, the tithe that we give on Sundays is not mandatory, no, it's, voluntary. it's voluntary. That's the difference between a, a high priest of Israel that have to get the tithe, and Melchizedek that Abraham voluntarily gives his tithe. It's a big difference between mandatory and voluntary yeah. because in the New Testament or in the church, you can give 10% or you can give 9% or you can give 5%. It's between you and God. Or you can give 20%, but 10% is like a good idea, but it's not mandatory. But there are churches who make it, make it mandatory. Uh, I was a friend of a, a pastor, very nice guy. I think he changed. I, and I remember it was in Peru when I was, he was telling his church, if you don't give 10%, you don't belong in this church straight out. I was there when he said it. Wow. Yeah, he said it. And that was terrible because uh, that's not right. And then he changed because he, uh, he, he came here and then he got involved in the Messianic Jews and he really transformed himself. He said, I found the truth. Yeah. The Messianic is that way. And he made himself a rabbi and he would sign rabbi. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then one day he announced it. It was in Peru, you know, he said, uh, 
from this point, I'm not going to say Jesus anymore. Oh. Yeah, no more. His real name is Yeshua HaMashiach. <laughs> wow. I know. And then we, in Spanish, you know, we're talking, yeah, but what about all these people that were saved by Jesus? Jesus. You know? But he didn't acknowledge it. I said, from this point on, I found the truth, and this is, you know? And those words were never said in Hebrew. Yeshua, Yeshua HaMashiach were never said in the Old Testament. Uh, Yeshua is the name for Joshua or Jesus. Joshua. But Jesus the Messiah were never said in Hebrew in the Old Testament because but Jesus was Christ. in the Greek New Testament. But then I would talk about Greek and right because he wasn't born yet. Not only that, but he, was not an, he wasn't acknowledged right. as Jesus the Messiah right. in the Old Testament. Right. He was not as, as the Messiah, only the New Testament revealed it. Right. Okay? So if there was a saying Jesus the Messiah should have been in Greek language, not in Hebrew. But the Messianic churches mentioned Yeshua HaMashiach. Because I guess it, it looks it sounds cool. Yeah. And then when, when you when they write letters, they do not write the word God. They just put G and put like a line. Because uh, it's lack of respect to write the word God. Right. So it's taken to another level, which yeah. is distracting. And it's too bad that this person, he changed so much. And then the following year, when I went to visit him, he really changed even more because the, the women were on the front. I mean, the, the men were at the front with the shawl and everything, with the little hat, hat and the women were in the back. So he changed yeah, yeah. for, you know, which is very unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Every year he changed more and more. Yeah. <laughs> And then he stopped come, he stopped going to a church on Sundays. So he saw that's not biblical. And that he criticized everybody because the Seventh day Adventists think that go people that go to church on Sunday, that's not biblical. Right. Okay? They they say no, it's gotta be the Sabbath. Sabbath. But that's not it, because the Sabbath for us is a spiritual Sabbath, a spiritual rest. But that's another lesson, okay? All right. So it says here, King of righteousness. What described Melchizedek this way? would impact with the special forces Jewish readers from whose names were significant because it was accepted the names. Oh, by the way, let me mention something. Remember that uh, story about Lazarus and the rich man in Luke? Yeah. I was asking if that story is uh, a parable or is a real story. I found out that uh, it's a real story because it mentions names, Lazarus. Right. If it was a parable, the parable when Jesus said a parable, he doesn't mention any name. He just mentions the story. I always took it as, as real. Okay, well, some people say, well, that's a parable. It's not really oh. real. But uh, people say, no, it's real. Because if you read other sources, it describes more or less the uh, abyss between the saved and the unsaved. Mm -hmm. You can see the other side, but you cannot cross it. Very interesting. Okay, so let's continue. Um, he says here, this is also a description of the nature of Jesus, our high priest. It will also add to the order of Melchizedek the special quality of righteousness. How Melchizedek acquired his name is not discussed. But the writer has clearly mentioned the son's love of righteousness. And this, for him, is a crucial point in his present position. So Jesus is a king of righteousness, and Melchizedek is also king of righteousness. So he's making a comparison between Melchizedek and Jesus. Then also, King of Salem means King of Peace. This is further significance in the name of the priest king city, or peace, another symbolic deduction from what appears as a historical fact. Although he has not previously linked peace with Jesus Christ, his whole presentation of Christ's work implies, implies it, since righteousness might be the basis of all true peace. His, in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul calls Jesus Christ our peace. Yeah, you know, you gotta have peace to be righteousness, you know? You gotta have in, in, your, in your life peace, mind, you know? Um, I was watching a, um, a documentary yesterday about how um, in the World, World War II, Germany invaded, of course, so many countries. Mm -hmm. And then he forced people to work for the German thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially France. France was a very high output in the cars and all that. But when they were forced to work, where the, the production dips, and they found out if you are forced to do something, you are discouraged. There is no incentive. Right. You know, it's like a, a dictatorship. 
why should I work an extra hour when I'm not gonna be compensated? Mm -hmm. So the production, okay, you know, and the Germany production was very high because they were very, uh, uh, the people who were making weapons were very capable, but they had to take him to fight the wars. So they could put somebody in, in instead, and they put slave labor, which is not the same thing. And on top of that, they were exploited. I mean, so you, of course, production is going to be down, even though they have guards around it to force it. There's so much they can do on production there. Well, in the meantime, you had to stay in Britain. They were giving incentives to work hard and hard and hard. So it was just a matter of time before, you know, uh, because uh, they 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 venture in the in the short war. They took a gamble. Think it's going to be a short war. That's it. But in the long run, the production of armaments won the war. Anyway, all right. So. Verse 3, uh, James, verse 3. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. That's a strong statement, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Without father or mother, without genealogy. Because there is no mention of the origin or death of Melchizedek in the Genesis account, the writer deduces that he is with father or mother or genealogy. He has always, always been drawn out from the narrative an interpretation which does not appear on the surface of the Genesis account. But this train, this train of thought is clear. Now, in the in Genesis, it doesn't say all that. Mm -hmm. He has added it to it. Right. And because it comes in, that's, that's all he says in Genesis. But he adds he his own. He was like a forerunner of Jesus Christ. Right. But here he's saying he has no father or mother. Right. He just adds to it. You, right. It's a deduction that he does, you know? Um, then, unlike the Aaronic priest, from whom the Levitical descent was essential for eligibility to hold office, Yorim Melchizedek is a whole different kind. There is no account of his father or his children. He stands mysteriously apart from the need to establish his genealogy. For this reason, he's again suited to be compared with Jesus Christ. So the writer of the Hebrews said, this guy comes from nowhere, so it must be an angelical being, it must be a spiritual thing, an angel of some kind, you know? He comes out. Not only it comes, he, but he has this title of the Most High, and Abraham, which is the top man at that time yeah. in the world, yeah. gives him that as about him. Mm -hmm. All right? So this is a comparison that he makes yeah. and tells his readers, this is, you have to take it by faith, because that's what the Genesis says. Yeah. You know? Either you take it or you don't take it. The whole Jewish priesthood was founded on genealogy. Personal qualities did not enter into it at all. But Jesus Christ was a true priest, not because what he inherited but because of what he was. And he said, without beginning of days or end of life. Taking this literally, it would suggest that Melchizedek must have been a heavenly being. That's what we're talking about. In which case, the historical account will be spiritualized, since there is no suggestion in the Genesis narrative that Melchizedek was anything other than flesh and blood. So in, in Genesis, it doesn't say he was an angel. It just says he was man, came out. Yeah. But the writer of Hebrew said, must have been an angel. Okay. But I don't think he would be an angel since he was a priest of the Most High. Right. Or may, maybe not an angel, but a heavenly being. Yeah. You know, of sorts. Uh, when when the Bible is silent, you try to fill in yeah, the holes. Yeah, I, I think he was like the forerunner of Jesus yes. Christ. Yes. The idea was he not in itself. Forever. Right. The idea was not in itself. The, the idea would not in itself have seemed strange to Jewish readers. But it's somewhat unexpected to find out that Melchizedek is considered a priest forever, just like the Son of God. And he said, resembling, resembling mm -hmm. the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. The word resembling occurs only here in the New Testament. There is a suggestive word used as a copy or model or being similar to. The important factor which the, which the writer wishes to establish is the eternal priesthood of the Son of God, rather than Melchizedek. So Melchizedek, like you say, is a forerunner. But the emphasis in the Son of God, which he later is implying, what makes Melchizedek order perpetual is that the scripture says nothing right. about the succession. In other words, Melchizedek is a priest forever. Nobody succeeds Melchizedek. What makes Christ perpetual is, however, his own nature. The title Son of God takes the thought back to 414, where Jesus, our high priest, is giving this title. So he's making a comparison, like he said, forerunner. Okay. Number four, now, uh, Carmen. Uh, just think how great he was. He was the patriarch. He was mm -hmm. the king of the 
Okay, he says, just think how great he was. Yeah, he was great. Even the preacher of Abraham gave him a ten of gold. Just think how great he was. This is exhortation of the greatness of Melchizedek is based on his superiority to the acknowledged greatness of Abraham. Both Jews and Christians recognize the greatness of Abraham. He stood out in the stretch of history. Now another joins him to whom he offers a tithe, an action which shows his recognition of Melchizedek. And he says here, even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. The words of the patriarch comes at the end to emphasize the dignity for the one who's really tithe. So let's go to the next page. And uh, especially it's appropriate to a tithe of Abraham because Abraham was regarded not only as the father of Israel, but also the whole family of the faithful. Verse five, um, Nico. Okay, this is what we talked before. The tithes in the Old Testament was a mandatory. Not only with 10%, but with other taxes, like four or five ta offerings. But they're all mandatory, okay? The tithe in the Old Testament was mandatory. The tithe in the New Testament is voluntary. Mm -hmm. Big difference. Some preachers in the New Testament said, you gotta, you know, it's an obligation. No, it's not, mm -hmm. it's voluntary. Because you can give less, you can give more. The comparison between which the writer makes here is not between Abraham and Melchizedek, but between Aaron and Melchizedek. This is the two orders of priesthood that he has in mind. This explains the sudden reference to Levi. All the Aaronic priests, the Levites, had to be descendants of Levi, which at once contrast with Melchizedek, who had no descendants. The Levitical priest had a legal right to take tithes from the people. So it's mandatory, legal right. Okay, it's a taxation. In a matter of rights, Melchizedek differed from the Levitical priest in that he resists title, not by command, by voluntary and spontaneous actions of Abraham. This is again the, the main point of this thing. No attempt is made in this epistle to explain why Abraham tied his spoils. The writer is content to leave the matter. So a lot of things he doesn't mention, like uh, Melchizedek gave uh, you know, wine and, and bread, and uh, that's the right of the Hebrews does not dwell into that. What strikes him is Melchizedek all out superiority. Aaron's priests, moreover, exact tithes from the fellow Israelites, who, like them, are descended from Abraham. The contrast now is between Abraham's descendants, the Levites, and Abraham himself. The writer implies that Abraham's gifts must be greater than the gifts made by his descendants. You see, this is the last. The writer implies that Abraham's gifts must be greater than the gifts made by his descendants. The descendants of Abraham were the Levites and the Israelites and us, okay? But they're all the sense of Abraham. But by Abraham giving tithes to Melchizedek, his offering is greater than our offering, since he is greater than us, in a sense. Basic principle seems to be the status of the recipient determines the status of the giver, because the recipient is always superior to the giver, right? The one who gets the tithe dies is superior to the one who's giving the tithe. Okay, verse six, uh, Robert. Okay, genealogy, as we said before, was an indispensable factor in the Jewish priestess system. The writer is obviously anxious to show that although Melchizedek is without genealogy, he nevertheless received tithes and gave a blessing to no less a person than Abraham. Moreover, as Abraham has already received the promises from God, the blessing received through Melchizedek was an addition which would have been priced only had it been acknowledged as coming from a Mekulian source. Now, who received the promise from, directly from God, Abraham. Abraham was the man of faith. He received a promise. Through your seed, Isaac, we're gonna make you descendants. We are descendants, you know, throughout. Now, you can't get higher than that. Promises from God himself, no. okay? <laughs> but then Melchizedek blesses him. So it's only worth it if the blessings are more or less equal to the promises, which is perhaps he make it equal. So it's only worth it, like, a, for example, uh, I get a promise from God, and I tell him a promise. And then Nick also gives me a promise. Of course, God is that's greater than him, you know? Priority. But if he is in the same level of God, it makes a big difference. It's right. like a condition, okay? He's making the, the, the comparison. 
right? All right. So it was for Marquis David was priest of the Most High, whose blessing he conveyed. Okay. The next page, the writer as it were transported even the readers on time to show the continuous order of the priesthood. Now he said, I relate this story in the past, but since Melchizedek says a priest forever, he still lives. He tells us, uh, you know, it's like the son of God. He brings the story to the present. Now, verse 7. Um, and without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Okay. The writer underlines the superiority of Melchizedek to Abraham. By calling it without doubt or beyond dispute, he expects his readers to accept this position without question. It's an essential link in his argument for the superiority of Melchizedek over Aaron. James, verse 8. In the one case, the tent is collected by people who died. In the other case, by him who is declared to be living. Okay, right. what does that mean? Exactly. It means that uh, in one case, the tent is collected by people who die. Who collects the tent? The priest, the high priest. But the priest is going to die anyway. Mm -hmm. He's going to serve God for a few years, but then he dies. Then another priest comes, and then he dies. But Melchizedek is going to be forever, forever. That's the difference. Okay, he says here, in the one case, the tent is collected by people who die, like the high priest. But in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. So Melchizedek the, the, he says to be a, a, a high priest forever. So he says here, the contrast between here is a reference to Aaron's line in contrast with Melchizedek's, with the further contrast between mortal men and the one of whom is testified that he lives. Although the Levitical order was arranged by God, the priest was, after all, mortal men. The most they could expect was a few years of serving God. On the other hand, Melchizedek's order was entirely different, for the writer maintains his continual life. He does this by appealing to the precise text of Genesis. As used here, it's a delicate reminder that the writer is using his statement on a sword that has authority. So he's, called, he's quoting Genesis. He's not deviating from Genesis. He's just... Uh, trying to explain, okay? The high priests of the Israelites were mortal men who died eventually. But the high priest, which Melchizedek, still lives at least forever. Now, verse nine, uh, Carmen. One might even say that Levi, who collects the ten, paid the ten to Abraham. No, he, he, verse nine and 10 get to be tricky, <laughs> if it's not tricky already. So let me read this, the argument takes on a different turn as a relationship between Levi and Abraham is demonstrated. For an Orthodox Jew of the order of Aaron would be the only authentic priest order. For Abraham was not a priest. But he also suggests that since Levi was a descendant of Abraham, he could be said that to be already Abraham's body. Levi was a descendant of Abraham. Okay, so when you have kids of your own, you know, uh, you kids were either in your thought or in your seat already, all right? So that was saying. So that's why the Abraham is superior to them. Now, he senses that this method is somewhat strange, since he says one might even say, uh, you know, because it, it's very strange, the words that he said. It's an expression found nowhere in the New Testament. He seems to be preparing the readers for a form of thought which they might be familiar. So the next page said the idea is clear that Abraham's descendants are identified with the forefather, and that therefore the Levitical order was in effect acknowledging the superiority of Melchizedek. The force of this argument would come strongly to minds familiar with the idea of solid solidarity. What solidarity? Solidarity means that the, the Jewish people had a very strong family union. Nobody was independent. Like a United States, we put the emphasis on individuality. Uh, he made, he's a self-made man, or something like that, you know? But in, the, in, in, in Israel, the family was the center of everything, and the community was the center. Everything was done in community. Yeah. Nobody would do his own thing, okay? So solidarity means, you know, solid among people, okay? And it says here, the force of this argument will come more strong to minds familiar with the idea of solidarity as the Hebrews were, than those dominated by the idea of individuality. Neither the father nor the children could be independent of each other. Okay, and sometimes what uh, you know, what you are, your descendants will inherit. Sometimes, if you're an alcoholic, your descendants probably they have a, also a tendency to be alcoholic, or uh, you have a 
a physical thing, and you send us all get the physical thing. On the other hand, if you if your life is a high level, you send that we also, uh, you know, in general, in general, that doesn't always happen. You know, if you can see examples, for example, uh, Billy Graham, his son Franklin Graham, you know, he walked away from the faith when he was young. I mean, you, you could not find a better household, right? And he came back. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a pastor called Lloyd Pulley. Uh, he's a millionaire, and uh, he's a great pastor. And uh, his son grew up in this house, and uh, he was a very intelligent person. And uh, he also joined the Air Force. But then after that, he deviated, and he became a homeless in New York City. Mm -hmm. his, his family didn't know where he was. Eventually, he came back, and then he he was affected by all this. Uh, physically and then he eventually died so it was a terrible thing you know but uh, you couldn't grow up in a very household you know surrounded by by god but it's still you know things happen but in general that's what the writer of hebrew saying in general your kids will inherit your bad or good things all right so that's what i said and that's what the verse 10 is uh, because then when Melchizedek made abraham levi was still in the body of his ancestor what, is, what does that mean? When Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi, meaning the descendant was still in the body of his ancestor. So can you understand that part? You, you gotta repeat that before you understand it. Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. Means that the seed of your son was already in your body. That's what it means, okay? Or the loins or whatever. So Abraham's payment of tithes will be, could be transferred to his descendant Levi and hence the whole order of his priesthood. Indeed, Levi's payment of tithes to Abraham looms as large as, if not larger than, his right to receive tithes from others, okay? Now in summary, you know, let me, let me just say, through a series of contracts, the right of the Hebrews works the superiority of Melchizedek over the Levitical priest. He makes five different points. This is a summary of the whole thing. Number one, he said the Levites received tithes from the people and that's a right that only they enjoy. Melchizedek received tithes from Abraham, although he was not a member of the tribe of Levi. It could be argued that, well, that put him on the level of Levite is not proof that he was superior to them. So a writer adds four other points. The Levites tied the brother Israelites. Melchizedek was not an Israelite, but a stranger. And he was no ordinary Israelite from whom the received tithes, but from no less a person than Abraham, the founder of the nation. Number three. It was a legal mandate that the Levites had the right to excite tithe. But Melchizedek received tithe for the sake of what, was he, what he was personally. He had a, such a personal greatness that he needed no legal enactment to entitle him to receive. So Melchizedek received tithe voluntarily, and Jesus received tithe also voluntarily, not by compulsion. Number four, the Levites received tithe by as dying men, like we proved that. But Melchizedek is forever. Five, finally he produces a curious argument for which he apologizes before, before he states it. One might even say, Levi was a direct descendant of Abraham and the only man legally entitled to receive tithes. Now, if he was a direct descendant, descendant of Abraham, it means that he was already in Abraham's body. That's what we said before. Therefore, when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, Levi also paid them being included in Abraham's body, the final proof that Melchizedek was superior to him. It is an extremely odd argument, but it was no doubt convincing enough to those to whom it was addressed. So strangely enough, this argument magnifies the great truth that what a man does impacts on his descendants. If he commits something, he might transmit to his descendants either the tendency to that thing or some actual physical handicap because of it. He builds up ex excellence of character. He transmits a fine inheritance to those who come after him. Levi, on the argument of the right of the Hebrews, was affected by what Abraham did. So in the midst of everything, in the midst of this classical or radical or minical argument, remains the truth that no man lives to himself or for himself, but transmits something of himself to those who follow after him. What he's saying here, you cannot live in an island. What you do affects everybody. If you are 
in a, in a, in a family with a wife and kids, and you leave your family for another woman, or whatever, affects you out forever mm -hmm. in different ways. Sometimes uh, you rise to a to a high level. Sometimes you just go the other way, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so what what you do, even even if you're not married, what you you affect what people are around you. So that's the important. It's very tricky rabbinical argument right. what they're talking about. But uh, the writer of the Hebrews try to do the best we can. Yeah. Uh, we do the best we can trying to understand. Okay, so let's uh, let's close up with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to scrutinize your word once more to try to learn uh, the meaning of Melchizedek as compared with Jesus Christ. Uh, this is not the end of the arg argument or the end of the explanation, but it requires probably further uh, in-depth investigation on the part of each one of us. But uh, give us the, you got the wisdom so we can understand the words of your, of, uh, of your book. And uh, give us the strength to apply what we do learn in our daily lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let me.